All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Like, like uh, Robert said, my name is Rick Fox, and my lovely wife is Shelly sitting over there with the salmon shirt on. She's, she doesn't like being in front of people, and I'm not a huge fan of it myself either, but uh, uh, John asked me to do this, and so we'll see how it goes, you know. So forgive me if I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm not used to sitting up here, you know, even though I was telling my, my brother here, I do some uh, uh, prison ministry, and we'll have 25 guys in our room. I'm totally comfortable with those guys. I don't know why I'm nervous coming to church, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> that's right. So I'm going to share with you just a quick scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, and it says this. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. So if you're wondering why I'm here tonight, I think John was reading the scripture and he's thinking, Rick fits this role pretty well. <laughs> so uh, like, like Robert was saying, the title of this is the key to evangelism. And, and uh, John asked me to do this, I think for, for a few reasons, but one of them is just to encourage you guys. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one of the things my prayers continue is for our church is to see the Lord working in your guys' lives. You know, not just here in the body, but outside the church walls. And, um, and I believe that we have a lot of really, really cool people here. You know, a lot of people that love the Lord. A lot of people that are grounded in their faith. And so I, I'm very thankful for that. So before I begin, I just want to say a prayer and let's, be, and let's, let's get started. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that you are the creator of all things, Lord, that you're the one that makes us. You call us, Lord, you redeem us. You show us your grace, Lord, and one day we get to be with you in glory. Lord, I just pray that your word of truth, Father, would be enlightened to us tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified above all. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness in that. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, uh, when I, like Robert said, when I first came into town, I was driving down through Fourth Avenue. For those of you that have been through downtown Olympia, which I'm sure most of you have been, there's a there's quite an uh, obvious element down there, isn't there? You know, there's a lot of homeless uh, and poor. There's a lot of evergreen students, uh, and it's just a you know a community that's really been slowly getting uh, more. Uh, it's getting built up, you know, and I think they're trying to do it more so. And so as I was driving through downtown, I was looking back and forth, and I am not used to that. When I was from small town Oregon, you know, there was maybe a couple homeless people in the whole city, you know, that we'd see. And I'm driving through town, and I'm thinking, somebody needs to do something here. You know, I, I, in my naivety, you know, I'm thinking, you know, you know nothing's going on. And so uh, I just started praying about it. And at that time, uh, the church was in a transition they, uh, we, were, we were doing some construction here, and so we were meeting down, downtown uh, at the Washington Center for Performing Arts. And, uh, and so I was down there one day, and we walked through there, and I was always reminded of this calling as we're walking through the city. And, and we were standing out front, and I was hanging out there with Sean McLaughlin, and Sean probably doesn't remember this. But uh, um, I said, Sean, you know, I just feel like somebody needs to do something about this homeless problem, you know? And, uh, and in terms of just ministering to these folks, and Sean's like, well, we have a Friday night group that meets downtown. And I'll tell you, the moment that you face with this reality that I, you could potentially be um, taken into a moment of obedience that quickly when you're not expecting it, <laughs> it was a little terrifying. All of a sudden, I was just like, I was thinking to myself, whoa, too fast. <laughs> Uh, Sean kind of knocked my socks off on that one, and so I, th I was thinking, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, you know, and I, I thought, I'm going to pray about it, you know, like all good Christians do, you know, and hopefully God will lead me into that, you know, so, so I think a couple of months went by, and I was just totally disobedient, you know, and uh, I just kind of kept pretending like Sean didn't tell me that. <laughs> and uh, we had a men's uh, get-together out at Black Lake, and uh, Pastor Chuck was teaching that night, and he told everybody to, let's get together, let's break off into groups of like 8 to 10, 
And, uh, and let's just, I want you guys just to share with one another some of the things that you're being disobedient about, and things that's going on in your life, and just kind of share with one another. So obviously that was right at the forefront, you know. So there was probably, it was a good, it was a good turnout. It was maybe 100, 150 guys at this, at this group. And uh, so there was a lot of small groups throughout the auditorium. And, uh, and as I was started to share what I had been disobedient in, this guy in my little group of four or five said, Rick, I'm actually the leader of the group that meets on Friday nights. And I'm going to hold you accountable to that. <laughs> you think that was the Lord? He, he, he works that way, doesn't he? He just kind of helps give you a little boost, you know. And, uh, and so, and fortunately, Chuck, uh, he just was really good about calling me. Hey, Rick, we're, we're going to be down there. Just come on down, you know. And so he, he really helped strengthen me to, to initiate that. So I get down there. I'm hanging out on the street corner of 4th and Washington. I'm looking around. And I'm looking at all these people. I'm thinking... What do you say to these people? You know, Jesus loves you, you know? I mean, I'm thinking that's going to come across so corny, you know? Me just walking up to somebody and saying this. I don't think that anymore. But, but at the time, it just, it just thought, that's gotta, I've got to have a better way of doing this. Well, Chuck just said, Derek, just follow me. You know, don't worry about anything. Let's just, we'll, you just kind of hang out with me and watch what I'm doing. And, and so we walked across the street. And right off the bat, Chuck initiates a conversation with some guys. I'm just kind of standing there, and I'm just looking around. And, and this guy, this, this red-headed guy, is just standing on the corner, just kind of acting like, are you going to talk to me or not? And, uh, um, and so I thought, well, I'll just strike up a conversation with this guy. Well, this guy happened to be from my hometown of Lebanon, Oregon. Oh. You know, the Lord, he just, he, he does that over and over and over again, you know, with obedience. You know, I don't know how many times I go downtown and I'm trying to share the gospel. And I'm, I, I just, one of my guys I really adore, his name is Ray Comfort. He says, he goes down dragging his feet and he comes back clicking his heels. And it happens every time. And uh, it was just the Lord showing me, Rick, I'm with you. I'm going to just make this easy. And, 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 and so a process began. So I, I, I had this dilemma in my life. I, I, I tried to share the gospel through the years, and, and, I was, and I was familiar with these passages, like 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And I'm thinking, you know, that applies, I think to, it applies to everybody. Um, and, and so as I, as I strove to, to, to understand what God's calling was in my life and how do I do that, the Lord began to reveal to me what that looked like. Uh, and, so, and so as I, as I started branching out into this ministry down on Friday nights, um, it, was, it was kind of a, a slow process, but it was, it was just a, a situations where I would go up to somebody and I would talk to them about yeah, hey, what are you doing tonight? Yeah, this is why we're down here, you know. Or we'd, I'd try to bring a couple blankets with me. Or we'd, you know, we'd bring uh, maybe a little bit of food or, a, you know, a little help packet or something. Just something to try to engage people. Because it was scary. And every person we went up to, you know, it was a different situation. And some were scary looking. And some were not so scary looking. And I'd try to bring Shelly down with me. And everybody wanted to hug her. I decided that was a bad idea. <laughs> All the guys wanted to hug her. You know, they're real friendly to these, these sweet little young, sweet, short girls, you know, out there. And it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to look for some women for you to minister to, honey. But uh, she was at least, she at least tried. I gave her credit for that. So, so as, I, as I continued to, uh, to grow in my faith, the Lord continued to reward me. I started gaining more confidence. Uh, as I you know, met people down there that I would see consistently. And we, we do that all the time down the streets. We... We uh, will have someone that is down the same area every week or every night sometimes. And so you just go up to them and just say, hi, how's your week been going? You know, and you get to know them. And they get to know you. There's a familiarity there. Uh, and some, sometimes there are women that are, they consider themselves street moms, you know. And so they're, they assume a responsibility of, uh, of, of, like, leadership down there for a lot of the younger kids that are out of control. And, and uh these moms aren't necessarily in good shape, 
you know, they're hooked on meth or they have a drinking problem, whatever it might be, but they still have these roles that they try to play. And so, so trying to minister to them, I would ask them questions like, are you a Christian? And uh, they would say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, you know, and it's like, okay, where do I go from there, you know? Are you a real Christian? You know, you know, and they're sitting there smoking a, you know, a joint or something, and thinking this does not correlate. You know, and so, so as I, as I started to grow in this, I began to search the Scripture. Lord, what is it you're trying to show me through this? Well, He showed me John fifteen sixteen. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And so. Right off the bat, the realization is this is not about me. This is about what he has called me to do. And I, he, I recognize the fact that he put this on my heart. And so, so the determination here is obedience. He said, uh, you know, John the Baptist talked about it in Matthew 3, 8, to pr produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You know, um, you know, Mark 16 and 15 is a classic one when Jesus commands us all to go into the world and preach the gospel. You know, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we, we see all these commands for us. You know, this isn't, this isn't uh, evangelism in the world. It isn't a special calling. You know, many times, I grew up in a church that they look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and they look at all this, these gifts in the body. But when you look at 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about evangelism, things like this, but it's in reference to the church. It's not in reference to shining your light to the world. And many people have used that as a bailout. You know, I'm not called to do this. Now, you may not be called to go down to downtown, but we're all called to be light, to be salt and light in the world. And so the question remains is, what is God calling you to? Are we being obedient to that? You know, and so when we look at works, when, I, when, I, when, we, when we talk about obedience, we have to talk about works. You know, there's good and bad works. You know, bad works, you know, Isaiah 64, 6, uh, I, I, that's one of my favorite verses. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And our righteousnesses, our righteousnesses, you know, what we try to do outside of what God has purposed for us, you know, it's like filthy rags before a holy and just God. And so I've, I, I, I'm, I've learned, or I'm still learning, that this can't be about me. This can't be something I just, you know, want to go try to be a good person, you know, or try to do, do something good. This has got to be initiated by God's work in me. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, in 1 John 2, 9, it says, but they went out, and they're talking about um, uh, the false, false teachers and the uh, Antichrist type of individuals. And it says, they all went out that they might be made manifest. You see, people that do it in the wrong spirit, they're going out with an intent of glorifying themselves. Does that sound familiar? Anybody in the Bible and the Old Testament? Yeah, that's what something Satan, I mean, Lucifer himself, you know, he wanted to glorify himself. It's that spirit, that satanic spirit, that darkness, you know, that unfortunately we've all inherited, <laughs> that, that evil nature. And, and, so, and so as we, as we look at our, our lives and we say, you know, who are we? You know, are we, have we been made new? Is the Holy Spirit dwelling within us? And God begins to transform our lives and we begin to trust him with that. You know, that's an, a reflection of the Holy Spirit being manifest through us to the world. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does... Well, only the one who does will of my Father who is in heaven. So, you have these works of the flesh, and then we have works of righteousness. You know, works of righteousness, uh, 1 John 2, 6, it says, He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So we, we have a model there. We, 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 we start looking at Scripture and we say, who are we going to model our lives after? You know, there's, there's really nothing in my life that's really original, honestly. You know, I mean, I, I fit that classic role of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun, and that's in case in my life. I, I've done a lot of coaching through the years, basketball, Northwest Christian, and and uh, I don't have really an original thought in basketball. 
You know, I, I just thought, I'm going to look up and see who did this really well, and I'm going to try to mimic it. And I'm going to look and see how this is fit with my players, you know. And some things worked and some things didn't, and part of my growth and transformation was just understanding how to apply that to my team. Well, it's the same thing with us, oftentimes, you know. We, we, when we recognize God's call in our life, you know, it's, 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 it's the Lord is working already. He's doing work in people's lives everywhere, you know. You know, the Lord, I rarely go up to somebody before that says, oh, I've never heard the gospel in my entire life, you know, or about Jesus. You know, the Lord has been working in their lives. As a matter of fact, it says the law has been written on their hearts. It, it, it's, it's pretty clear when you see people's consciousness. You know, they, they, they know right and wrong. I'll go up to somebody that's just a complete sinner. I mean, they don't, they're proud of it. And I'll ask them about right and wrong. You see evil down here? Oh, yeah, I see you all the time, you know. About are there good people? You know, I ask them oftentimes, are they good? Yeah, I try to be good. You know, they recognize good and evil. That's that's something that God's written on everybody's heart, even if they're not a believer. And so, when we look at these, these uh, this fruit of whether it's sin or of righteousness, there's there's a ton of scripture, and I, I don't, probably don't have time to get into that. But but it's 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 very evident in our lives, and, and as a believer, the Holy Spirit does, it shows us that. You know. So as I started to, to step out and be obedient, um, I, I went for several years, and I was kind of off and on. I wasn't consistent down there. There's times where, you know, I you know, just went through dry spells, things like that. You know, it's, it's not like I'm just Mr. Joe Christian, I'll tell you that right now. You know, I, 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 I let, let sin in my life, you know, and it hinders my walk with him. And I just sense this deadness, you know, like, like you know, wet wood, you know, it's just, it's not on fire for the Lord. And I'll go down to the streets and I just sense, man, it feels like the Lord's just not even working through me right now. Matter of fact, I'm thinking, what am I doing down? I'm going I'm gonna, to get in the way of something he's doing. You know, I, you know, I, and so the Lord continues to show me how important it is to draw near to him. You know, it, you know he, his word is very clear about that. As we draw near to him, he draws near to us. You know? And as he does that, we, we begin to gain an affinity, uh, a reflection of who he is in our lives. Matter of fact, we begin to understand in greater sense of, of what his purposes are. We begin to see, uh, you know, what, what the Holy Spirit sound, or, or, or looks like in, in working through our lives and what he sounds like and hearing his voice. It's, it's just that drawing near. He just, he, 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 he kind of teaches you as you go. You know, uh, there's, there's this famous quote, and I can't, I can't do it justice right now. It's this guy from the 19th century French preacher, and he talks about the crux of it is, is as you go and obey, you, the word is revealed to you. That's what it was. And, and, and I see that in my life all the time. So this last year, I... Um, I just, there was a, there was a time, and Shelly and I, you know, it was this period of time in our life where we just felt like, there was this, we just felt like we couldn't communicate. It just seemed like everything we discussed was, was, was almost like an, as like an argument, I would say, and, and, um, and we just couldn't seem to come to a good conclusion. And when we really broke it down, we were going to realize we're saying the same thing. It just felt like we were battling this battle. And one morning I woke up and, and the Holy Spirit just spoke in my heart. Rick, you're under a spiritual attack. I mean, I, I woke up, and the moment I woke up, the Holy Spirit spoke that in my heart. I realized, Lord, you are, this is you. I got up, I went right downstairs, and I got on my knees, started praying against it. And, and I, I just sensed the Lord's anointing at that moment, that humility. And, and I just, I, I don't know why, it, the Lord began to draw me closer to him again in such a way that... that um, at the time, I thought, well, I was already trying to draw close to him, but, but obviously I, I began to see I hadn't. And so I thought, I'm going to just search this out. I need something more to go off of. So I started, I, I, I remembered this guy by the name of Ray Comfort. I don't know if anybody has heard of Ray or not, but he's probably the greatest street evangelist in the world. I would call him to say that right now. The guy is amazing. And, and he just has so many great tips and techniques and ways of going about approaching people. And I thought, I mean, if anything, I can learn something from this guy. So I found some of his website stuff. And next thing you know, uh, I came across this whole biblical school of evangelism course he's got. 
And so I thought, you know, it was kind of expensive, and I thought, you know, I really want this. I need, I need to grow. I, I, I feel like when I go up to people, I don't really know what to say to them. I go up to them and I'd say, well, Jesus loves you. Or I try to lead them through the four spiritual laws a little bit. You know, and, you know we're all sinners and what the wages of sin is. And, and people would just kind of, you know, they just could care less. You know, some people would talk to me about spiritual things, but they'd more, it was more of sharing with me just their background and their history. And so I thought, i got to have something more to give with these people. I, it's just not working. So I started going through this, this, this course. And, and, and one of the things that I learned immediately is this key to evangelism. Okay? That what this key is something, as I started searching scripture, that everybody has used. It's just not new to man whatsoever. You know, John's been talking a lot about it. Ever since I've, I've been doing this course and studying this and living it out, I'm hearing it everywhere. And I may have just been deaf to it before. But, but as I look through Scripture, Jesus used it when he, was te- when he was sharing the gospel with people. I see Paul did it in Romans 3, 19 and 20. James did it in James 2, 10. Stephen used it when he preached in Acts 7, 53. And so I'm going to read to you just a little excerpt here from one of my teachings. And so we found also that Peter found that it had been used to open the door to release 3,000 imprisoned souls on the day of Pentecost. John talked about that just recently as well. Jesus said the lawyers had taken away this key, that they had even refused to let people enter into the kingdom of God in Luke 11, 52. The Pharisees didn't take it away. Instead, they bent it out of shape. They took this key and they warped it. And, uh, and so in Mark 7, 8, Jesus returned it to its true shape. And, and, and that was actually prophetic. You know, it says in Isaiah 42, 21, that uh, the Messiah would, would, would uh, magnify the law and make it honorable. That's what he would do. And so, and so as we look at this key, um, we begin to realize that, uh, that it's, it's actually pronounced throughout Scripture. Acts 28, 23, the Bible tells us that Paul sought to persuade his hearers concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And so we begin to see this pattern of evangelism to people, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's people on the streets, as co-workers, whatever it might be. This is, there's a pattern of evangelism that I have been missing all along. And so... It, what I found is, is this Ten Commandments. It's God's law. And, 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 and so it's, you know, it's, it's not unfamiliar to anybody. And anybody who's grew up in America, especially in the last, you know, prior to the last few years, there's Ten Commandments were everywhere. So, so what we see with evangelism, and particularly with the models we've seen, is this pattern. There's both prophecy and the law. The pro- prophecy... Oftentimes what it was used for was to, uh, um, it, was, it was used as inspiration to help to, to speak to people's intellect. So when, when people, when you reveal prophecy to people, it was, it was a way of helping people understand that the word is true. Uh, the other means was by the law. The Bible tells us that in 1 Timothy 1.8 that the law is good if it is used lawfully. For what purpose was God's law designed? The, the following verse tells us, it says, The law is not made for a righteous person, but for sinners. It says in 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. It even lists the sinners for us. You know, disobedient and ungodly and murderers and, and so on and so forth. In Romans 7, 7 it says, The law of God is evidently, the, actually, uh, see, it had not, Paul wrote also, he had not known sin but by the law in Romans 7, 7. So this Ten Commandments is obviously this key to evangelism. Jesus mentioned in Luke eleven fifty two, he was speaking to lawyers, and when he said, he says, those who should have been teaching God's law so that sinners should receive the knowledge of sin and thus recognize their need for a Savior. Instead, these guys warped it out of shape, and so it twisted it, and it made it confusing to them. Matter of fact, they tried to put more laws on people, and that was part of that warping. You know? Psalm 19, 7, one of my favorite verses it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You know, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. You know, it's a beautiful song I used to sing when I was a kid in, in Christian school. And so to illustrate 
Let me give you guys an example of why the law is so key. Suppose I came up to you and I told you, I've got good news for you. Someone has paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. What, do you, what would you think? You'd be like, what are you talking about? It's, I, 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 don't, I don't have a speeding fine, and I certainly don't have a $25,000 fine. You know what? This guy is crazy, you know? Wouldn't you? It, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't make, it wouldn't be good news to you. It wouldn't make you any sense to you, would it? You say, uh, you know, not only would it seem foolishness to you, but um, it would also I'd be offensive to a lot of people because I'm claiming, I'm telling you that you've broken the law and you don't even, aren't even aware of that. See what, what happens there? Now, now, uh, now, suppose I turned around and I said, well, how if I put it this way? While you were out today, the, the law clocked you going 55 miles per hour through an area set aside for a blind children's convention. Now, the speed limit was 15 miles an hour through there. And we had set up 10 signs for you, warnings to slow down, warning you what this was going on. So what you did was extremely dangerous. You see what would happen? It would make more sense. So someone who you don't know just stepped in and paid your fine for you. $25,000. What would that mean to you? Wow. Man, I'd like to thank that person. Well, well can you can tell precisely what you've done uh, wrong first actually enables the good news to make sense. So, so uh, if I don't clearly bring understanding that you violated the law, I'm going to continue to read from this a little bit, then the good news would seem foolishness and offensive. But once you understand that you've broken the law, then that good news will, will become good news indeed. So in the same way, now spiritually speaking, if I approach an impenitent sinner and I say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, or I just tell him God loves you, uh, it would be foolish and offensive to him. Because I'm telling him he's, he's a sinner. And these guys don't even know what sin is. And there's a lot of Christians I've even talked to that I ask them, What's, what is sin? A lot of people don't even know what sin is. Believers have been in the church for a long time. They'll have to sit there and think about it. And so, so as a result of me sharing with them, preach sharing with them God's law, what I do is I help reveal to them their position before a just and holy God. See, the Bible says that preaching the cross to them is foolishness. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, you see, some of these scriptures begin to make more sense when I start comparing it to the law and to compare it to the way that we share the truth with people in evangelism. So if I take the time to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and the way he did it, it makes more sense. You know, John 4 is a classic example of the way Jesus did it with the woman at the well. Now, one of the teachings I, came, I, I, was, I learned through this is this acronym RCCR, Reveal, Create, Convert, and, and then uh, repent. And so reveal, or, or relate, I'm sorry. Relate, reveal, convert, and repent. So RCCR, reveal, create, convert, repent. Sorry. Got to think about it for a second. So, so, re, so relating, what I'm doing is when I'm relating to somebody, just like Jesus did, he just walked to this woman and he, he asked her for a drink of water. You know, it's just a basic need. And she was willing to share that with him. Then he begins to explain to her, he starts creating a spiritual connection to, with, that, with that water. You know, as he begins to create a spiritual connection, he starts opening up an, uh, an avenue for the gospel. He starts, he starts revealing to her then, as we see, you know, I'm not going to go through this whole thing for lack of time, but he, we begin to see him creating this understanding of her predicament before a just and holy God, you know, her sin that she was living in. And then he reveals his grace to her. I'm the son, I'm the Messiah. You see, what, what does she do? She runs to, this, to the town and shares with everybody. They, it, it changes that, that town. That model is the model that we're, 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 we're given in terms of how we approach people on the streets. And so as I, as I begin to look at the law, 
and alive. I, I have no idea how to prepare for this, and there's just way too much information, so I'm going to have to whip through this a little bit quicker. Um, um, <laughs> so um, as we begin to, as we look and say, okay, how does this relate to us? How do we model this? Um, I, I, what, I, what, I, what I did was, is I started looking for ways to relate to people. So I don't know if you guys noticed out front, I put some tracks out there. Yeah. Those tracks are a way to connect with people. So um, I've got this, this, this one that's literally is my absolute favorite, and my wife is probably so sick of seeing these. But um, um, I'll go up to somebody, and I'll, and I'll just I'll say, hey, can I show you something cool? You know, and I don't, I don't care who they are or where they're at. You know, I, uh, the Lord has given me a boldness beyond the street now, where it's just, you know, it's, it's amazing what he does in you. You know, it's before long, he's like, you don't care. So, so it's, you know, I'll be at the kids' basketball game. Kids absolutely love these things, the high schoolers. It just blows their mind. And, and so I'll, I'll find some kids, see, on the front row, and I'll walk up to them and say, hey, guys, I'm, I've got a really cool thing I want to show somebody. You guys look like cool guys. You want to see it? Sure. You know? So I say, tell me, do one of those look bigger to you than the other? And, and the kids look at it, and they say, well, yeah, the red one does. You know? And so then I flip them around like this, and I say, now which one looks bigger to you? And the kids just, oh, man, you know, and they go crazy on it. And so I say, I tell you what, I'll give you guys a set. And they just gladly accept this gospel tract. I mean, they, they are hanging on to it. You know, so, so I tell them, I said, the answer is on the back. You know, it's not really the answer how the cards work. It's an answer to Jesus, what it is. And so it says card one and two and explains the gospel. And so they take it home. They show their friends. They show their parents. They give it to somebody. You know, it's just a way to get a gospel in somebody's hand. So sometimes they just don't get an opportunity to share the gospel with them. So it's just one way to bridge that gap. You know, another way is just, just, a, just a regular gospel track. You just hand it to them and they say, what is that? It's a gospel track. Oh, no. no, let's kind of watch the response. Some, some people will just look at it and they'll kind of compare it and they'll think, you know, and you can tell if something's churning. So I'll just ask them a little simple question. You have a faith in God? Do you have any kind of a belief, you know, a spiritual belief? Well, you know, and they'll start sharing with me. <clears throat> and it just opens an avenue to start, start sharing the gospel with them. So I immediately... Start, I start kind of going to this little spiel I have because what I've found when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody is that you get about 10 minutes and then it, your time's done. You know, they just, they, you lose them real quick. They're either busy, you know, maybe a timeout in a game and I've got literally two minutes to do this, you know, uh, or they're just on their way someplace and they stop for a second and they listen to you and then, and if once you kind of drag it out, they're done. So, so we oftentimes, you know, in a classical gospel presentation, it's really tough. If you try to relate to somebody just on a casual basis, you don't get those opportunities. How do we get the gospel to somebody in a short amount of time? Just sort of though, because remember, we're, we're just planting seeds. Some people, the Lord has prepared. When I first started doing this, I was down at the street reach because I, 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 I served through city gates on Thursday nights. And uh, I was just standing next to the fence and I started using this on some people I was discipling. I had one guy um, accept the Lord through it, and, and I, was, I was getting excited about it. And these two guys just come wandering up the fence, and they're watching things that are going on, and this just doesn't ever happen. And, and this guy is like, man, this is crazy. You know? And he goes, you guys are the ones that showed this movie down here? And it was this Decision America guy group came out about a year or so ago, and they showed a movie, the Jesus movie. And these guys happened to have wandered through at that time. This was four weeks later. This guy brought his buddy over with him, and I realized... The Lord's work in his heart. And goodness, that the Holy Spirit created some discernment there. And, uh, and so I just, I started sharing the gospel with him, and I used this method. And uh, I was in five minutes, we're holding hands, and he's accepting the Lord over this fence. And his buddy is just like, he's just like, what is going on? And, and afterwards, I started talking to his friend, and I said, what do you think of all this? And he's like, oh, we're walking down the sidewalk, and next thing you know, we're standing here talking to you, and this is all going on. And, and I just, the Lord, it's like that red-headed kid, when I first came down on the street on Friday night, the Lord just threw me a softball. You know, he, and this was early on. He just got me excited about this, you know. And, and so how do you use the, the, the law when you're sharing your faith? Well, 
the law, first off, you've got to remember the law, you know. <laughs> so, 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 so I pray before I go out. I always pray, Lord, lead me to who you want me to show your grace to. That's it. If I'm, you know, I, like I said, I, I uh, steal things from people. I've got a buddy by the name of Brad Payne that was telling me about how he took some sandwiches down the streets to, to share with some homeless people. And I thought, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. So I went down Saturday morning and got a few sandwiches and some coffees. And I prayed like that before I went down. And I'll tell you, it is the most awesome ministry. I love doing this. It costs 10 bucks or so, 13 bucks. I drive up to some, I'm riding on the street, I roll my window down, hey, are you hungry? Have you eaten yet? No. Would you like something? Yeah. All right, so I get out of my car, I say, I've got a sandwich and coffee. Hey, thanks, man. And I'm like, you know what I prayed before I came down here? I prayed, Lord, would you just lead me to who you want me to show your grace to? You know what he did? No, what? He led me to you. I said, no, you know what that means? No. It means that he hasn't forgotten you. It means that he loves you. I tell you, these guys will just start crying. <laughs> I tell you, it just that when you when you share God's love with people, it just in a simple way, a practical way, it just it affects them deeply. And um, <clears throat> the Lord, through this, as He's been building my boldness, led me led me down to the well. The well's down a Fourth Street, and it's just massive drug activity. And I tell you, it was scary. The Lord just keeps bringing opportunity for opportunity down there, you know. And there's guys down there that want that get in my face and yell at me. And the Lord sometimes would just take the worst guys down there and turn them right around and have them open doors for ministry. I've had a guy do that before. Get right in my face is right here. And all I was thinking was a soft answer turns away wrath. I just kept telling myself this, and I just kept responding gently. And next thing you know, he just turns around to the crowd as he was busy doing something. He just turns around to the, all these group of kids. And just says, does anybody here believe in God? And I'm just standing there. And I was like, Lord, you just opened up an opportunity. And I just started sharing the gospel. And the Lord just gave me this open, open court to share the gospel. with. And kids started rolling in. They started walking over. I had kids start peppering me with questions. And I had a chance to share the gospel. And then I, a couple of kids were really, really keyed in on this. They kept asking me more questions, more questions. And one, one finally, this one girl and I stepped aside and she just was broken and she recommitted her life to Christ and not open opportunities to start doing some discipleship and try to get her key back into this church she had come from years ago and it's just one thing after another like that the Lord opens up I go down there and I stand there and I look around and just recently one of my brothers his name is Lorenzo you might see him here shortly but in the next few weeks but he started coming to church for the last two weeks I just go down there he thinks I'm a cop he turned, he, he's like getting ready to fly. I walked over to him. I started sharing the gospel with him. He thinks saying, you know, we're, I'm praying with him. And he wants to be discipled. And he wants to come to church with me. And next thing you know, I'm ministering to his girlfriend. And the Lord just opens up doors like that. It's just, just putting yourself out there. So I'll go up to somebody. And I, I'm running out of time. So i got to share this real quick at the end. I'll go up to somebody. And I'll have my tracks. And, and I'll just... I'll, like I said, I'll say, hey, can I show you something cool? And I'll say, okay, what is it? And, and so I'll show them this, or I'll give them a gospel tract, and I'll start, I'll initiate this process. And I'll say, you know what? I, get, I come down here, and I show this, and this. And, and this, this, oftentimes perception doesn't match up as reality, does it? No. Uh -uh. If you see that in your, around you, yeah, all the time. You know? Well, it's the same thing with people. People oftentimes perceive themselves differently than they actually recognize or realize. So I'll say, you know, for instance, I'll, and I'll, and I'll kind of use like a third person. I'll say, I oftentimes come down here and ask people, are you a good person? And I'll ask, then I'll ask them, I'll say, what do you think people tell me? Oh, yeah, probably, you know. And I get a few people that say I'm a bad person. You know, I can skip past all the law stuff, you know, and go right to you know, God's mercy and grace and what that looks like, you know, how God redeems us. But, but um, as I say, as I ask them about the goodness, I say, well, you know, and I'll ask them just a couple of quick questions. You know, what does goodness look like? How do you know how good you are? You know, Hitler thought it was, he was good killing six million Jews. He thought that was a good thing. So, you know, see, there's different levels of goodness, and some are very evil. And so as we look at the patterns of, of ministering the gospel, um, 
I, I just quickly relate a couple of uh, examples like that, and then I quickly get into the law and grace. And so I'll say, you know, there's a, there's a standard of goodness that the Lord holds us to. That's, that's what we're going to be judged by. You know what that goodness level is? What? It's God's law. It's His moral law. You know what the moral law says? And I'll just, I don't have to go through all ten of them, unless they're just really self-righteous. And I keep rolling through them. But, uh, you know, an easy one is, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. The ninth one. It basically is don't lie. You know, I'll say, how many lies do you think you've told in your life? Oh, man. I won't say, have you lied? Because oftentimes they'll say, no, I haven't lied. But I'll say, how many lies do you think you've told in your life? I don't know, hundreds, thousands. Well, if you tell thousands of lies, what's that make you? A liar. You see, they admit it themselves. I'll say, the, Lord, the, the law says, thou shalt not steal. Have you ever taken anything that's not yours, irrespective of its value? Mm, yeah. You know, even a pack of gum, doesn't matter what it is. If you steal something, then, then, then you're, what does that make you? A thief. Yeah. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you even look upon a woman with lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already. Or if it's a woman, I'll say a man. You know? Have you ever struggled with that? Yeah. You know. So you know, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart. You know? So if you stand before God today as, a, as his, your judge, is he going to find you innocent or guilty? You know, probably guilty. You know. So are you going to go to heaven or hell then? Well, and, and I'll share with them, like Revelation 21, 8, you know, all liars, you know, are, are going to burn the lake of fire. It's a second death, you know, or 1 John, you know, or, or 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, you know, and, and, or, you know, I'll, you know, I'll just share with them some scripture that helps them understand what the consequences of that sin is. And I'll say, you know, that's when I share the grace. God, I'll magnify Jesus. See, see, what happens is people realize real quickly, it says in Romans 3, 5, 7, 10, it's everywhere. Romans is just a pattern for sharing the gospel. The law, you know, that's what the law is for. And so, so as, I, as I show that to them, then I show them, you know what the answer is? See, and I'll relate it to practical things on earth, you know, like stand before a judge. And you know, like we shared, we talked about with that speeding ticket. Say, if I go over here and I murder somebody, the judge watched me do it, and I'm standing before the judge, because people will tell me all the time, well, isn't God all forgiving? You know, doesn't Jesus forgive sins? You know, I mean, I believe in God, you know, all this kind of stuff. I say, well, say I go over here and I murder somebody, and I stand before the judge and say, judge, I heard you're really forgiving. Matter of fact, I know your name, and, and, I've, and I've, I'm just really sorry. What's the judge going to do? Well, that's great, Rick. You know, that's great that you're sorry. It's great that you know me. You know, it's, I am a forgiving guy, you know. But I'm, my responsibility as a judge is to hold you accountable to my law. It's the same thing with God. He's a just judge. And he's going to hold us accountable to that. And I help them understand their predicament before a just and holy God. Jesus made it very clear in John 3. You know, we have one of the famous verses of all time in there. And yet he talks about that we all stand condemned, that the wrath of God abides upon us. And so I help people understand that God is not all loving. He doesn't just throw out this blanket, not the way they're talking about it. He doesn't just throw this blanket of love out on everybody. He showed his love to us through Christ on the cross. And so I share with them what Jesus did. He came in and he dismissed your case. He wrote it off. All you have to do is accept his measure of grace he gave you. And then Jesus said, repent. In other words, you're going this way. And now I'm going that way. I was doing my own thing. I was breaking your law, God. And now I'm going to follow you. I'm going to stop breaking your law. I said, that's obedience. You start trusting him with your life. I said, it's easy. It doesn't take some magic words. You don't have to say some wrote down prayer. It's your heart. God looks on your heart. And he measures you by that. And if you have a humble and a contrite heart, the Lord will not despise you. You see, all these scriptures, they all start making sense. They all start flowing together. It all relates to evangelism. It all relates to us being a light to the world. And these people are like, oh, that's cool. You know, and then sometimes they're getting ready to leave and I say, hey, thank you for listening to me. You know, and I'll, if, I, if they're really keyed in, I'll pray with them. You know, and, and some people have had a chance to lead in a sinner's prayer. Not, not that often, sometimes. But it's usually just planting seeds and maybe stirring up some rocky and thorny ground. You know, for someone else to come along. You know? That's what we're called to do as believers. We're all called to do that. Our neighbors, our friends, our family, 
everybody. The question is, is are you going to be faithful? Are you going to get past that fear? That it's scary, I know, it's terrifying. But if you go in with a purpose, you, you like Ephesians 6, you know, you prepare yourself, feet shot with the preparation of the gospel, memorize a few scriptures. No, it's, it isn't that, that hard. Just, what I did is I just typed them out on my printer and just read them every day. I just started trying to memorize a few. It doesn't take much. Learn just the law. And then just learn how to share with people. And it's the easy way just to start sharing the gospel with people. And it has an impact. It magnifies Christ to the world. And I tell you, when we do that as a, as a people, as a body of believers, we're not only fulfilling God's purpose in our life, but what you begin to see is His truth revealed in you. You begin to see it. He begins to build into you a, a foundation of faith and understanding. He just starts opening your eyes to his truth and understanding how to walk in his spirit. So anyhow, I, I've gone over. I don't want to give up any more time with Tad and, and Leslie. They're doing it. They're, they lead an awesome worship. I really enjoy coming out here on Wednesday night listening to them. So let's just pray, and I'm going to hand it over to them. Thank you, guys. Father, I just thank you for your grace. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth, Lord, and the calling that you've placed on all of our lives. I pray for my brothers and sisters here tonight. Lord, I just pray that you strengthen them. I pray that they be encouraged. I pray that your hope, Lord, be revealed through them to this dark, this lost world. Lord, that is blind. Father, I, I, I just pray that you just go with them, that, you, that they be encouraged, that you just eradicate all fear like you said, Lord, to fear not. And, and that you just give them a boldness, Father, in sharing the gospel. Maybe with that person that has been on their heart and they've been just fearful of it. Father, thank you for your mercy in our lives, for allowing us to take part in what you're doing in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.